Welcome everyone. My name is Emily Birak. I'm an editor at Alma, a Jewish culture site that's a partner of my Jewish learning. Um, I also worked with Shoal as a research assistant on his book, um, his biography of Mir Kahana, The Public Life and Political Thought of an American Jewish Radical, which came out yesterday, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, just to give you a brief introduction to Shoal before we get going. Shoal Magid is a professor of Jewish studies at Dartmouth College and a Kogod Senior Research Fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. He's the author of many books and essays. His two latest books are The Bible, the Talmud, and the New Testament. Oh, oh gosh, I'm going to mispronounce this. Elijah V. Solovnitschik, Commentary to the Gospel, and Piety and Rebellion, Essays in Hasidism, both published in 2019. His new book, Mir Kahana, The Public Life and Political Thought of an American Jewish Radical, was just published with Princeton University Press. That's what we're here to talk about today. So welcome, Shul. Thank you. How's it going? Um, so just to get started, how would you, after spending the years researching and writing this book, how would you describe Mir Kahana to those, to those guys? Oh, wow. That's a, <laughs> a big question. To I, thought you were gonna say, I thought you were going to say how we describe the book that I could actually. Oh, sure. We can start there. <laughs> no, because in a, in, in a certain sense, I kind of, um, I think the book is a cultural biography of Mayor Kahana, but I think it's also a, um, a kind of uh, a study of post-war um, American Jewry and Israeli Jewry. And it's really looking at the post-war period through the lens of this one very particular, um, uh, you know, figure who is either, you know, despised or admired or venerated, depending upon who you are. Certainly, a, certainly a polarizing figure uh, in American Jewry and, and, and in Israel as well. And one of the things that I, I try to do in the book which I just want to state at the beginning is that a lot of times when people hear about Mayor Kahana today, they think about Israel, they think about his career in Israel, they think about his election to the Knesset, they think about his removal from the Knesset, they think about the Kahana's party and questions and accusations of racism. Um, and of course, the kind of continuation of the legacy of Kahana in contemporary Israeli politicians. What I try to do in the book is really argue that if we do that, we're looking at Kahana backwards, that in fact, his American career and what he did and what he what what he what he did in American Jewry is in some ways as or even more interesting than his legacy in Israel. And I can explain that more in detail and that we kind of miss something very, very significant in terms of understanding contemporary Jewry in America today in the 21st century, if we don't uh, really understand how he entered into the sphere, the public sphere in America in the 1960s, what his contribution was, what his intervention was, what his criticisms were, and how they continue to kind of reverberate um, half, a, half a century later. Yeah, absolutely. I want to get into all of that, but I think my first question is, is that, you know, why, why should we care about Kahana in 2021? You sort of hinted at this of how his ideas have like reverberated, yeah. especially in American Jewish spheres. But you know, if you can just say, what, like, why this biography? Why now? Why? Yeah. Why his yeah. ideas are are mattering to us? Well, it's moment? funny because somebody said to me yesterday, "Oh, you know, P, you know, this book is going to be popular. People are going to buy it. Talk about it because of the kind of Kahana's movement in Israel." And and I told him, "Well, actually, most of the book is really about America. There are only two chapters about Israel." And the reason why I think he's important today um, is that I think that he is in many ways unknowingly embedded in the subconscious of collective American Jewry. Now, I know that sounds kind of flaky or nebulous, and so I kind of want to unpack that a little bit. Uh, what I mean by the collective subconscious of American Jewry is that Mostly in America, we don't really think about Kahana as continually to be influential. The Jewish Defense League doesn't really exist in any kind of, you know, any real way anymore. And in a sense, uh, it's easy to kind of forget about him. It's not so true in Israel. In Israel, people talk about Kahana all the time because there are contemporary people who identify as Kahanas. And I think, so, I think the problem with that is that by ignoring Kahana because we think that he doesn't really resonate anymore, I think we're missing something very important in the way in which he understood America in the post-war period and the way he understood Jewry and the way he understood the threat of liberalism and threats of anti-Semitism uh, 
and the ways in which that many Jews in America have absorbed many of those critiques unknowingly and still are responding to it in a variety of different ways. Yeah, definitely. Something I was really struck by in reading the biography and just, you know, working with you is, is how much, how many, excuse me, how many of Kahana's ideas have really moved to the mainstream and things that, you know, he was on the fringe of in his time are now talked about constantly in like the, in the mainstream of the American Jewish establishment. So something like how anti-Semitism is a threat everywhere, it's a threat on the left and the right, or how, you know, we need to like assert our Jewish identity and Jewish pride and things like that. I feel like we see that very often in the modern American just Jewish discourse. Yeah. What is it like as someone who studies Kahana to see these ideas? Uh, you're like, this is Kahana in a different well, shape and form. You know, you know, you know, I think that he, there was something very instinctual about him. I think that he was very much a middle brow thinker. He wasn't an mm -hmm. intellectual. He wasn't particularly learned in the, you know, in the ins and outs of um, uh, kind of the Western philosophical tradition, say. I mean, he did go to law school, graduate from law school, and never passed the bar exam. So he certainly, he had a certain basis of knowledge, but he really thought from his gut in a way. And he, I think he really intuited certain kinds of changes and things that were going to happen in America that, in fact, actually happened. So, um, in, a, in some sense, the real enemy for Kahana, and this is, you know, we think about oh, the enemy were maybe kind of the, the black, the black, the black nationalists or the enemy were the Arabs in Israel. The real enemy for Kahana, the real danger to Jewish survival for Kahana was liberalism. That was what he was really attacking, whether he was attacking it in the Israeli mainstream, or whether he was attacking it in what he called the American Jewish establishment. Liberalism was something that he felt ultimately was going to fail the Jews and was going to prevent them from creating the conditions for their own survival. So in a sense, we could say that um, the emergence of neoconservatism in the 1980s, of which Jews played a very prominent role, in some way is an extension of Kahana, although neoconservatism is very different in all kinds of ways in terms of its secularism, in terms of its um, uh, kind of political ideology. But the very notion that liberalism was going to, um, going to in a certain sense, um, endanger Jewish survival is something that he felt very strongly about. And part of the reason that he felt like Zionism was a failed project because I think he does think that Zionism is a failed project at a certain point. He becomes mm -hmm. a counter-Zionist, not an anti-Zionist, but a counter-Zionist, was he feels that he felt like Israelis had really adopted an, an American style liberalism um, that was basically making them the same as the diaspora. Now that's, that has really changed. And in a certain mm -hmm. sense, Israeli society has moved closer to what would one would call a Kahanist worldview. And I, I think it's important to make a statement here because I know people are going to kind of shake their heads and say, oh, no, 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 you know, Israel is not a Kahanist, you know, it's not a Kahanist state. And it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I, I think that there's a, there's a distinction that I work with in the book that I think is very important. And that is the distinction between Kahanist tactics and Kahanist worldview. In terms of Kahanist tactics, sure, he was a militant, he was advocating violence, um, either against the Arabs or against, you know, anti-Semites in America or against African-Americans. And in that sense, he was very much a product of his time. I mean, he's coming up into, you know, coming up into the, into the public sphere in the late 1960s, the culture wars, the race wars, the Watts riots in 1965, the emergence of the Black Panthers, the assassination of Malcolm X, um, the, the Students for so Democratic Society, the Weather Underground. I mean, militancy was really something that was very much a part of that period. And I'm sure there are many people um, in, you know, that are listening that remember that period of time. But, and that of course has dissipated uh, for the most part. But there's a difference between his tactics and his worldview. And his worldview, I think, really has sunk roots deep into the American subconscious. And that worldview is ultimately liberalism is not a friend of the Jews. Anti-Semitism in the left is worse than anti-Semitism on the right. Anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism by another name. I mean, the kinds of things that we talk about today, as, as, as you said, Emily, in the mainstream, 
the things that he was talking about. The fear, for example, of intermarriage. Kahana writes a book in 1974, Why Be Jewish, about intermarriage. There were very few people that were writing about intermarriage in 1974. It wasn't really considered to be an existential problem um, yeah. uh, in that way. Um, you know, there's a chapter uh, on race, and it's a complicated chapter. I know somebody asked a question, you know, Kahana wasn't anti-Black, he was anti-anti-Semitism. I think it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, in the chapter on race, I tried to really tease out the way in which he used racial categories, what I call the grammar of racism, in order to promote his ideas. Uh, he has this famous uh, essay that he wrote called "Brother," uh, called "Brother to Brother," da a letter to Brother David or to Brother David, who was a the guy named David Solomon, was an African American convert to Judaism, and he was trying to use Solomon as an example of saying, "Well, I'm not really anti-race; I'm just kind of pro-Jewish." And if a black person becomes a Jew, then there's there's a Jew as much as anybody else, which I think Kana really believed in some way, and yet he thought there was something that was inherently racist about the black identity movement. So he had a complicated relationship with people like Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael and Sonny Carson, people that were in some way a model for his own movement. And also he felt that they were part of the problem because, because the anti, the anti-Semitism that exists within the black community was uh, somehow endemic and also related to um, what was then called third worldism or the identity, mm -hmm. the identification or solidarity with Palestinians yeah. after 67. And I feel like Kahana really gets his start in America, you know, on an anti-Black sentiment with the forming of the Jewish Defense League and Oceanal Brownsville oh, sure. and, and that yeah. whole thing. But something I'm, something you read about in the race and racism chapter and something we've spoken about is how Kahana's idea of race and his like conception of race didn't really work when he got to Israel and that's sort of how he failed or one of the reasons why he failed when he moved from America to Israel. What was that view of race and why when he made Aliyah in 1971, what, what was he confronted with there in yeah, terms it, of- It's a very interesting thing that happens in, 70, in, in, he, in 71 and then 72, because as, as some of you know, in the early 70s, there was the emergence of something called the Israeli Black Panthers, which is a group mm -hmm. of Mizrahi Jews uh, who, in Jerusalem who, or actually may have started in Haifa, who um, uh, were basically, in a sense, modeling themselves after the Black Panthers in um, in in America, uh, uh, Black Panthers in Israel, and Kahana felt, and they were basically they were basically um, rebelling against the uh, Ashkenazo-centric liberal, you know, government that they felt was discriminating against um, against. Uh, uh, Mizrahi Jews and Kahana felt, oh, this is a, the, the, this could be my base. In other words, I could use them uh, as a as a support for my attack against the kind of liberal Ashkenazi elite. But it ended up backfiring for two reasons. First of all, because the Mizrahi Israeli Black Panthers saw Kahana as a white person, and second of all, because the Israeli Black Panthers in many cases found solidarity with Israeli Arabs. So in a certain sense, there was a triangulation between the Israeli Arab community and the Mizrahi community and the white Ashkenazi community that Kahana really didn't predict because he was living in a racial paradigm that was closer to America, which was there were blacks and there were whites, basically. So it ended up blowing up in his face and the Black Panthers and the Israeli Black Panthers wanted to have nothing to do with him. Sorry, I'm going to, uh, something we spoke about in the interview for JTA, which I'm not sure if folks here read, but I can share a link, is um, how Kahanism, or Kahana failed in Israel, but a version of Kahanism, which you refer to as Neo-Kahanism, is kind of succeeding. So can you just talk more about why you think Kahana failed, whereas sort of some of his ideological heirs or I think, legacy I think Kahana, are succeeding? Yeah, thanks. I think Kahana fails in Israel because he isn't able to translate the American categories that he thought in into an Israeli context. And he was always seen in Israel as being an American. He spoke with a very, he spoke Hebrew with a very heavy American accent. I mean, there was something that was very un-Israeli about him uh, as, a, as a figure. The neo-Kahanism that we see today in people like Itamar Ben Gvir and, and Gopnik and others is really a kind of synthesis of kind of cookie-in, romantic, mystical messianism and 
Kahane's kind of militant tactics. Now, so for those who don't know who Cook okay. is, can you just explain? So, yeah. You know, Rev. Cook, who was the first, Rev. Abraham Isaac Cook, who was the first chief rabbi of Palestine, Mante Palestine, um, and then his son Svi Yehuda Cook, who became the leader of the of the movement and became, in a certain sense, the kind of patriarch of of the settler movement. Um, advo we're advocating a certain kind of romantic, mystical messianism that we were living on the cusp of the messianic era, and the secular Israelis, unbeknownst to them, were really being part of a larger cosmic process. So they should be, you know, they should be kind of absorbed. Um, and Tzvi Yehuda Cook, the son, went even further to say that actually the state itself, it's not only that the land is holy, but the state itself is holy, and serving in the army is a mitzvah, and all these kinds of things. Kahana was really not interested in that at all. In his writings on Zionism, he doesn't talk about Cook, he's not interested in Cook, and the reason why he's not is that for Kahana, what mattered was power and conquest. He really didn't um, have any ear for the kind of romantic mystical vision that the Cooks had. The neo kahanists the ones that exist today, are really products of the religious Zionist educational system. So they're coming with a Cookian perspective and they use Kahana as a kind of tactical tool to be able to um, achieve their objectives. And I, I wanna make one point because I think it's an important one which I allude to in one of the chapters. The Cookian Zionists or the settler Zionists will not use Kahana's violent militant tactics as long as history is moving in their direction. In mm -hmm. other words, once it seems like the West Bank is becoming a permanent occupation, once settlement continues, there's no really reason for, for settler Zionists to become violent because in a sense, the state is really doing their bidding. The Kahanism comes in after Oslo. The Kahanism comes in after it seems like the government or the state or history seems to be moving in the opposite direction. That's where the militancy enters. That's where the violence enters, where the settlers feel like they actually have to act out themselves because the state is not really acting for them. Yeah. So when thinking about, you know, his time in America as a lens on his time in Israel, how do you see his early you know his militancy. Oh, there you go, getting out of the sun. How do you see his? How do you see his uh, militancy and his tactics and his violence in America? How do you? How do you understand that in the early years, and then how it how it manifests itself in, in Israel? Yeah, I mean, there was an essay that I that I published a couple of years ago called "Anti-Semitism as Colonialism and Mayor Kahana's Ethics of Violence," where I talk about that at length, and it didn't really make it into the book because the editor felt like since it was published elsewhere, it really didn't need to mm -hmm. be there. But it, it, it's a good question. Violence for Kahana in America really played a number of different roles. In a certain sense, it played the role of a deterrent to fight against anti-Semitism, but it also played an important role in terms of identity formation and self-fashioning. Mm -hmm. And here, he's very much reading from the Black Panther playbook, that in, in a certain sense, the ability to act violently, to fight back, is something that will create a, an identity of Jewish pride, what he called Hadar, which he borrows from Jabotinsky, Zeb Jabotinsky, the Zionist Jeb Jabotinsky, that it will create a certain kind of identity formation and pride that Jews otherwise didn't have. So in a sense, what Kahana is doing is he's taking the kind of muscle Jew idea of early Zionism and he's constructing it for a diasporic Jewish reality. Because even though Kahana remained a Zionist, he says very clearly at the beginning of his career, 1968 and 1969, that he is creating the Jewish Defense League to save the American dream for the diaspora Jew. Mm -hmm. That the Jewish Defense League was a diasporic project. And it, he only turns to Israel after he immigrates there in 1971 and decides that that America is really hopeless and Jews don't have any chance of actually surviving there because ultimately either anti-Semitism or liberalism will swallow them up. Mm -hmm. So when you think about how he's using violence to sort of refashion the young American Jewish man, it was mainly predominantly men, um, what are some ways you see that legacy today in America, not in terms of violence, but in terms of how he's talking about, you know, strong Jews and Jewish pride and bringing Judaism into the streets and, and all of those ideas? 
Well, I mean, you see it in a lot of ways. You can see it uh, on on the on the on the right side of 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 the Jewish spectrum in terms of um, uh, Jewish summer camps that have these Israeli week long Israeli Gadna programs where they kind of like dress up in army uniforms and you know do all of these military things and bring 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 IDF soldiers from Israel to the summer camps to do that, or you can see it in the way in which. Um, during a gap year after high school, you know, parents send their kids um, to Israel to have to serve in this kind of Gadna program, which is kind of like faux army program. That's on the right. And you can mm -hmm. see it on the left um, in terms of the social justice movement. I mean, Kahana was basically saying Judaism should be in the streets and not in the synagogue in the 1960s. And what the social justice movement on the left is basically doing is the same thing. The main difference is, is that Kahana is saying, go out and protest in the streets for Jewish causes. And the social justice movement is saying, go out and protest in the streets as Jews for global injustice mm -hmm. and other kinds of universal causes. So the means are the same and the ends are different. Now somebody asked what 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 I what I mean by liberalism, and that's actually a good question, because obviously you know liberalism is a very broad topic, a very complicated topic, um, and what Kahana meant by liberalism was tolerance, integration, absorption into the larger society, and incremental change as the solution to social problems. In that sense, Kahana felt that Jews don't really stand a chance within that liberal framework. Now, again, liberalism is much more complicated than that, obviously, but I'm just trying to kind of give you a narrow definition when he talks about liberalism, what he means by it. Yeah, in terms of um, his involvement, just back to what you were saying before that, in terms of you know bringing Judaism onto the streets and his involvement with the movement for Soviet Jewry in America, um, you sort of see like how he's calling this a bar mitzvah for the men who are part young men who are participating right. in the protest. And so, you know, what happens after he like has that march and he's very successful for those who don't know, Mir Kahana was very involved in the movement for Soviet Jewry. Uh, where, where does he go wrong type of thing? Well, you know, um, the problem with Kahana is, as I say in one of the, one of the chapters, that he, he, keeps, he, he seems to keep making the same mistake over and over again. And that, that Soviet Jewry march in, in um, the Soviet Jewry march in March 1971 was one of his most successful acts. And it was one of the largest protests at the White House at the, in the history of the country at that point. Over 2,000 people were arrested, 2,000 young Jews were arrested, and he gives that speech as they're being arrested by saying, this is your bar mitzvah. And it's interesting because earlier and never again, he has this whole kind of critique of the American bar mitzvah, you know, the opulence of the smorgasbord and the Viennese tables and basically say that's where, you know, the bar mitzvah is where Judaism goes to die. Um, and so in a certain way, what he's saying is that this to, to fight and to get arrested for a Jewish cause is one's initiation into the Jewish people. Now, what ends up happening pretty soon after that is uh, the Seoul Yurok bomb bombing, which was, um, which was a JDL act that it's not really clear Kahana even knew about. And uh, Sorry, just to interrupt you, for those who don't know what the Seoul Yurok bombing is, can you just Give a little. Yeah, so Saul Yurok was a kind of impresario, Jewish impresario, and one of the things that he did was he brought Soviet acts into America, so the Bolshoi dancers and so on and so forth. And this was right in the height of the Soviet Jewry movement, and Kahano felt like this was a, this was a better and easier target. Mm -hmm. It was very hard to target Soviet diplomats and others, but it's easy to target people like Yurok. So basically, when the Bolshoi dancers would come, JDL people would you know, buy tickets to the show and they would come and they would throw eggs and they would throw mm -hmm. firecrackers and basically kind of cause a kind of disruption to, to, the, uh, to the event. So in, in January of 72, um, some JDL people, although they were never convicted, there was threw a firebomb into the building of the, of where, where Saul Yurok had his offices, which, and it wasn't intended to kill anybody because it was early in the morning, but it happened to be a young woman named Iris Cohn's was working early and she was killed. 
And that was really, in a certain sense, the end of the J, the beginning of the end of the JDL. Uh, no one was convicted for the act. Kahana thought, you know, came out very strongly against it. He claimed not to know what was happening. That weekend was the bar mitzvah of his son in Jerusalem. But I say this only because, in a certain way, after the Soviet Jewry march, Kahana was really riding quite high. I mean, he was basically being covered in all the major media outlets, the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, you know, all of the news outlets. He was really kind of emerging to be a heroic, a heroic figure in the movements, but um, he couldn't really, he couldn't really see that. He always, he, he oh, it was always moving too far. He continued to engage in armed smuggling, continued to engage in bomb making. He continued to engage in a kind of process whereby he was undermining his own, his own, you know, successes. And I think that really led to the demise of, of Kahana in America. And then just shifting to his time in Israel, in the book you write about how he switches from a, a Zionism, a like belief in the Jewish state, and you know he makes immigration to, to Israel in the early 70s to sort of this like militant apocalyptic post-Zionism. Right. Sorry. Yeah, you talk about that shifter. It's yeah. kind of very interesting. He, 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 he immigrates to Israel in 1971. Mm -hmm. um, and he, in September of 1971, and you would think, okay, he's an immigrant. He wants to become a very, um, you know, successful Israeli klita or absorption Israeli society and find his way there. But in the first 12 months or 18 months of his living in Israel, he's arrested something like 40 times. And spends time forty in, times. That's crazy. Something like that for all kinds of on what charges? Well, a lot of it had to do with arms smuggling, illegal arms smuggling, and and uh, he's he's referring to um, one of the things was he actually was working with his brother who was living there to try mm -hmm. to basically steal Israeli Uzi guns that were then going to be transported to America and used by the JDL. It was that kind of stuff. That was one of the things he was caught with. There are other kinds of things going into Arab villages and protesting. So in, in a sense, what I'm saying is that he goes to Israel and instead of trying to become a part of Israeli society, he immediately enters into this kind of confrontational you know, position with the state itself. Now, he does have political aspirations and he writes a book called um, Ha'etgar or The Challenge. He writes it in English and it's translated into Hebrew, which is his kind of program for, for, for Israel, he has aspirations of becoming prime minister. And he begins to build a kind of, um, uh, of, a, of, a, of a political constituency, but it's a political constituency that is really ultimately opposed to the general tenor of the state. Now we have to remember the state of Israel in the 1970s was labor, right? It's mm -hmm. only in 1977 that Begin and Likud get elected. So in a sense, He's fighting against the liberal, the liberal, yeah. the liberal society. Um, he's imprisoned in the 1980s. He spends a year in Ramla prison. And he also actually has to go back to America to spend almost a year in an American prison in sure. Atwood, Pennsylvania, because of he because of um, uh, transgressions and kind of parole mm -hmm. agreement that he had. Um, yeah, and. In a sense, once he gets to Israel, once he gets to, once he's put in prison for the year in Ramla, he starts to see that he's not really successful, that he's not really garnering the support to do what he wants to do. And he writes three books in prison. In one that one year. Years. One book is called The Thorn in Our Sides, and the other book is called They Must Go. And this becomes the kind of apocalyptic turn of Kahana in the 80s, where he basically is now wants to stage a kind of revolution to overthrow the state. I mean, that's what he's basically doing yeah. in 40 years. 40 years is a really fascinating book, which is really a commentary on the prophet Ezekiel. Um, and you see at that point in 40 years, in Thorn in Our Size and in They Must Go, that Kahana is kind of throwing down the gauntlet. And if he's going to become a political figure in Israel, he's going to do so to confront and ultimately to overthrow the liberal state. 
yet then he gets elected to the just if my timing is right right well he gets and elected a, to parliament yeah he gets elected to parliament and then um within a year of his elected parliament in 1884 the knesset starts to think about ways of getting rid of him and interestingly enough it's not only the yossi sarids on the left that want to get rid of him mm -hmm. the Ula cohen's on the right want to get rid of him right Ula cohen says famously the less kahana the better Right. So in a certain sense, it wasn't a left right split. I think that the that the Knesset saw that he was a danger to the stability of the country. Now, in 1985, there was a poll that was taken. Kahana wins one mandate, one seat in the Knesset when, okay. he, when he's elected after he fails twice earlier. And in 1985, which is the year after he's elected to Knesset, there's a poll done by a reputable pollster in Israel that 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 showed that if the election should be held, um, if election should be held today in 1985, the Kahana would win 11 seats. Wow. And at that point, you start to see that the government starts to go into full gear of creating an, an, an amendment to the basic law, which creates what becomes the racism law that makes his party illegal. So just flashing forward to present day Israel, how are we seeing these Kahanist figures in, in parliament or, you know, in, in uh, talks to be in governments and whatnot, you know, what, what changes? Because, because these, the, the present day Kahanists are really neo Kahanists. In other words, okay. they're, they're products of the Cook school. So they're know, not what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I mean, Svi the Cook said sure. the state is holy, right? So yeah. the, the present day Kahanists are fully willing to become part of the apparatus of the state. Whereas Kahana was at, at the end of his career against the state fully. Sure, and you see that really most prominently in his grandson, Mayor Edinger, who comes out very openly and says, yeah, my goal is to overthrow the state. I mean, I think that Kahana at a certain point in his career saw that Zionism was a failure. It was a failed project, what he called the failed Hellenistic project, mm -hmm. right? Where he talks about secular Zionists as being Hebrew speaking Goyim, and he calls the state a state of Jewish Hellenism. I mean, that kind of language is very anti-Cookian, right? The yeah. Cook language would be, no, the state is the vehicle for redemption, which in a certain sense, Kahana came to believe was not the case. Yeah, and one thing you write about in the book too that really was interesting to me was Kahana was saying, you know, Israel can't be a democracy and a Jewish state at the same time, right? Because you talked about how he had these American views of democracy and how right. he was bringing that to Israel. Can you talk more about those ideas? Well, I mean, you know, the idea of Israel being a Jewish and democratic state is interesting because it wasn't in the original Declaration of Independence. It was it was it was it was um, it was uh, added later. Mm -hmm. And there were many Jew there were many Jews on the left in Israel, like the Matzpen movement, the kind of Jewish socialist anti-Zionist who were who were saying in the 1970s that Jew that Israel can't be a Jewish and democratic state. But there were very few people on the right and in the center of Israel that were saying Judaism can't be a democratic and uh, Jewish and democratic state. And Kahana was one of the early people in the 70s that were basically saying that Jew, being a Jewish and democratic state is impossible. It's either a Jewish state or a democratic state. And it's because I argued in the book, he has a very American view of democracy, which is a kind of liberal democracy. In a democracy, everyone that's a citizen has to be assured equal rights. And if it's a Jewish state, then the Arabs in the country simply won't have equal rights, which is kind of true in all kinds of ways. So Kahana said that, that, that Israel had to make a choice. It was going to be a Jewish state and a democratic state. Now, subsequent to that, you have people like Ruth Gavison and Sami Smua in Israel, legal experts and sociologists that talk about ethnic democracy and Herenvolk democracy, different kinds of democracies that you can have. You can't have a liberal democracy in a, in a Jewish state, but you can have other kinds of democracies. Kahana felt that that was just not viable. What's yeah. really interesting today is that the idea of the impossibility of Israel being a fully Jewish and democratic state is not so marginal anymore. Mm -hmm. There are many, many Jews from, from across the spectrum in Israel that would say, yeah, that's probably true. And so we have to kind of make a choice. Now, in some way, you could say the 1918 nation state law is a move in that direction toward the Jewish state versus a democratic state. For those who don't know what the 1918 So the nation state law was a law that was passed by the Knesset in, in, in 2018, in 2008, 2018 ratified in 2019, which basically said that the state of Israel is really just the state of the Jewish people. 
Okay. That, you know, other people can live there and other people can be citizens there, but it's the state of the Jewish people and it's not the state of all its citizens. Now, the, you, know, I, you know, for those that have not seen the nation state law, it's worth going and reading carefully because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an important document, but it certainly is a move in the direction away from mm -hmm. a kind of liberal state that sees itself in a fully democratic mode. Yeah. And just, I just want to be mindful of time. If you have, um, if you're here and you have questions for sure, you can put them in the chat and I'll ask them at, at the end of, at the end of our convo. But I have two more questions. Um, one is that just flashing back to America and you write that, you know, Kahana is the Jew whom Jews would like to forget. And we write him out of our history and he's not even in American Judaism and, and, you know, He's not taught in American Jewish history classes. So how do we rework Kahana into, you know, the history and the story of American Jewish life? Well, that, I mean, first of all, I think that he should be, he should be taught. He should be read. He should be read critically. Um, mm -hmm. He certainly wrote enough. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I spent, uh, I spent many months in the archives looking at private materials, looking at regional newspaper articles, um, trying to reconstruct his worldview, but even without that, um, uh, I think that uh, he should be integrated into into the history of American Judaism and the history mm -hmm. of you know Judaism, certainly in post-war America. Um, now, one of the interesting things that that a couple of people asked, which I really want to address, like uh, because people had asked me, who did you talk to? Who did you talk to that new Kahana? Right? What did they? And, you know, I'm, I'm a scholar, right? I'm not an, eth I, I mean, I'm a scholar of Jewish thought. Um, I'm not an ethnographer. I'm not a sociologist. And I really, I lived in Brooklyn in the 1970s. I knew plenty of people who knew Kahana, but I really didn't actually talk to many people. I depended mostly on his written work and archival material. And I did that for a very specific reason. Because if I would talk to somebody about Mayor Kahana, they're going to tell me and many people have told me what they remembered from when they were in high school, when Kahana came to talk at their high school in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 50 years ago. So in a certain sense, for me, as wanting to get it as right as I can, that was not really a dependable source. Or people are going to have very strong opinions for him or mm -hmm. very strong opinions against him. And those things are fine. People can have the opinions they have. But... I don't necessarily think that's as legitimate as going in the archives and looking at the internal documents, looking at articles that were written at that time about what was going on in Philadelphia or in Dorchester or in Cleveland or in you know Houston, Texas. So I felt like it, uh, like my job, my my role was best served by listening to people what they listening to people what they had to say, but I wasn't going to base my research on what people remembered from 50 years mm -hmm. ago. When you were in the archives, you know, reading coverage of him, what surprised you the most? Um, um, what surprised me the most was how ubiquitous he was. And it was how much at a certain period of time, from about 1968 to about 1974, how prominent he was in the American media. In the New York Times and other major newspapers, but also in local newspapers. And... It, it, you know, I was also, I went through all of the JDL newsletters, which were coming out every week or weekly or monthly, depending upon the time, how much stuff was being produced was really actually quite phenomenal. So when you can think about, you know, the other thing I have a section of the, uh, of the book, um, which does an analysis of his famous 1972 Playboy magazine interview, which is a fascinating, it's really a fascinating document as a primary document, because this was the first document this Playboy interview in 1972, where Kahana knew that he was speaking to a much larger audience. He knew that he was not only speaking to Jews. And if you read the interview, you can still see some actually really fascinating things because the interviewer was very, very tough on him and was asking him very hard questions. And Kahana was answering very true to his own convictions. He wasn't trying to, um, um, uh, what's the word? He wasn't trying to kind of, you know, apologize for his views, right? Now, yeah. he said, did I, did I talk to anyone who knew Kahana? Sure, I lived with people who knew Kahana. I mean, Kahana was around when I was living in Brooklyn and when I was living in Jerusalem. So I certainly spoke to people. Yeah. When, 
when he is doing that Playboy interview and the other, you know, non-Jewish media presses, what message do you think he's trying to put out to, you know, we're talking so much about his impact on like American Jews and what message he was trying to convey to, to Jewish people. What was the message he was trying to portray to, to non-Jews? I think he was trying to portray a message that Jews are, 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 are here, they're here to stay that I, meaning Kahana, I am a Jewish radical. I believe in radicalism. I -hmm. don't believe in liberalism. I believe in Jews' ability to fight back and that we will fight back. And he was trying to create a certain kind of image of himself and an image of his community, which is that Jews are done with being the patsies of the world. Yeah. So I guess my question is, at what point do we do we lose that coverage of him and his idea? Was it when he moves to Israel or, you know, why does he disappear from, from national consciousness? Um, well, one, yeah, well, once he moves to Israel, he, he, you know, for the first couple of years from 71 till about 73, he's still very much in the news in America because of the way in which he's still active in the JDL. Mm-hmm. By 73, he begins his turn to turn his attention to his political career in Israel, mm-hmm. and he really kind of gives up on the JDL. There's one document in, to, in 1974 um, where it's an internal document to the Jewish Defense League where he comes back, and it's a very kind of scathing document about how the JDL has descended into a street gang <laughs> and people are using, you know, vulgar language, and this the people have completely lost the vision of what I intended. And that's kind of the end of it for him. After that, yeah. he pretty much leaves and doesn't doesn't engage that much with, with that community anymore. Yeah, I'm just gonna move to the chat box. Any questions? Um, Deb wants to know, why, why did you write this book now? You know, um, I wrote the book because, um, well, there's, there's a, there's a, there are a number of reasons why I want to, wrote the book, but I, I'm not going to give you the actual more, more kind of mundane reason. The reason that I wrote the book was that I felt, I, I, from spending a, lot, a number of years reading him very, very carefully and very systematically, I felt that there was something that was missing in the understanding of Jewish radicalism from the right in, in Kahana. Mm-hmm. You know, and I see, I see Jack Porter there, and Jack Porter published this book, Jewish Radicalism from the 1970s, and it does actually speak about Kahana. The book does actually include Kahana, so to, to be fair. But generally speaking, people don't really see Kahana as a part of the Jewish radical movement. When they think of Jewish radicals, they think of Jewish radicalism on the left. That's number one. Second of all, I'm a left-wing progressive, and I feel like Kahana was useful for me in my own critique of American Jewish liberalism. Can you say from more? A diff- from the different direction. In what? He helped you understand your own? I think, I think Kahana had a very incisive critique of liberal Jewish America at that time mm-hmm. in the 1960s and 1970s. The hypocrisy that lies at the spine of liberalism, and look, there's a hypocrisy that lies at the spine of everything, but the hypocrisy that lies at the spine of liberalism, the way in which um, the, the, the comfort and belief that American liberalism would ultimately be the savior for the Jews, mm-hmm. um, I think that some of that Kahana got very deeply, again, intuitively, he got very intuitively, he understood the way in which that was a dangerous p- perspective. And many of the Jewish radicals on the left at that time felt the same way, just towards different ends. So for example, when they asked Abby Hoffman, the f- famous you know, Jewish radical, but radical, I don't know if he was a Jewish radical or a radical Jew, but when they <laughs> asked Abby Hoffman what he thought of Kahana, he said, I agree with his tactics, but not his goal. Interesting. Um, someone has a question about Kahana's assassination, which we didn't talk about at all. Can you just talk about why? Kahana's assassination is a fascinating story. I mean, assassination. um, Murder, whatever, however you want to call it. Right. Um, uh, I just to David, no, that was actually Abby Hoffman. It wasn't Jerry Rubin. Jerry Rubin may have actually said what Abby Hoffman said, but it was originally Jerry Rubin. I I have the, I have the text. So he was assassinated um, in Manhattan at uh, the Marriott Hotel after giving a, giving a talk. And um, he was actually, I was at Brandeis. He spoke at Brandeis four days before the assassination. Wow. 
That Did was his last speak? talk. I think he spoke at Brandeis on Thursday. He went back to New York Saturday night. He had the thing, he had the, the meeting at the hotel and he was shot. The, the person that shot him, interestingly enough, was acquitted of mm -hmm. the murder for a variety of legal loopholes. And then was later convicted of being a part of the first World Trade Center bombing. And after he was convicted, Said Nosar is his name, mm -hmm. after he was convicted of the first World Trade Center bombing, he then admitted that he had murdered Kahana, right? Wow. And he, then he, served, he was serving a life sentence. I think he was actually up for parole just a year or two ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but the other interesting thing is that this Said Nosar also had connections to a number of different Egyptian clerics that had connections to Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda. So in some strange way, Kahana might have been the first American killed by what became Al Qaeda. Yeah, I see uh, David Levine is writing that some say it was the first Islamic terrorist act on US soil, is that true? Right, yeah, something like that. Yeah. How do you think Kahana would feel about well, I, <laughs> feel about that fact. Right. I know it's a little strange twist to the tragedy, I guess. Yeah, strange, strange. And then I, I think you, maybe we spoke about this or it's in the book, I can't remember, but you said his funeral was actually one of the largest funerals yep. in Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how, how can that be true if he was, dis, you know? Well, you know, he, even though he was ousted from the Knesset, he had a tremendous popular appeal. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, a lot of people came to his funeral. Yeah, um, you, know, I, you know, I'll give you another example of this if we want to jump from his funeral to 2016 or 2017, or even 2017, the Jewish press, which is, which was a, a, is, is a Brooklyn newspaper that Kahana, in, you know, for a certain number of years wrote for, mm -hmm. um, um, in commemoration of the yurt site, put together uh, a list of 35 leading rabbinic figures in America and Israel that came out spoke speaking positively about Kahana. Just a list of quotes of positive. yeah, a list of quotes. Right. Was it all you know in in context and stuff? Um, it was in context. Some of the things were things that were said at his funeral. Oh, interesting. Um, that, you know, many, many of the leading figures in Israel spoke at his funeral. Shlomo Karlbach spoke at his funeral. Um, uh, the chief rabbi spoke at his funeral. So it was, it was you know, it, it, it's, you know he, he was never a persona non grata in Israel, even when he was a marginalized figure, even when his party was made illegal. He still had a very popular following. It seems almost clear, I, I mean, this is a lot of what you discuss in your book, but his legacy in Israel is very visible to us. What would you, just as we're talking about his death and all that, what would you call his legacy in America, his most potent? Well, legacy? I think his legacy in America is almost nothing. And I think that's the problem. I, yeah. I, think, it, it, I think the legacy in America doesn't exist, but it does exist. Mm -hmm. Meaning that that's the subconscious point that I, I you to make, right? That in a certain sense, we ignore Kahana to our own peril. Mm -hmm. I mean, those of us that disagreed with him, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I see someone's raising your hand, but if you can type your question in the chat, that would be very helpful. Um, One of the things I, I find interesting while Jack typed in his question, one of the things I find interesting is that I talk to a lot of people who knew Kahana. I talk to a lot of people who um, have very positive feelings about Kahana for a variety of reasons. But what I find very interesting is many of those people, this is true in Israel and America, really have hardly read him. They really have read very little. Now, his book, Harayoni Yudi, The Jewish Idea, which is the book that he published at the end of his life, that is very widely read. Mm -hmm. But how many people have read Our Challenge? How many people have read Why Be Jewish? How many people have read Listen World, Listen Jew? How many people have read, you know, so, I mean, he, he wrote many, many books. And those mm -hmm. books actually are very clear articulations of his thinking. But he had a certain kind of public persona. And many people that, 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 are, that, that feel sympathetic toward him do so because of an experience they had 
either knowing him or listening to him or hearing him in a variety of places. If, if you were to tell someone who hated Kahana or loved Kahana or had no opinion on him to read one of his books, where would you tell them to start? Well, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think that Never Again is a fascinating book. Now, it's very much a timepiece, right? It, you know, mm -hmm. published in 1971. It's a breakout book. It's his first book, really. He had been writing in the Jewish press, and he had been writing in other places for a while. I think it's a really interesting reactionary, countercultural take on American Jewish liberalism in the late 1960s. And I think that, um, as somebody said, I, and I think it's true, as Alex said, right, his audience were, many cases, children of survivors who were um, resistant to their parents' quiescence, many of whom had been radicalized by the new left in the 1960s and who had kind of moved away from that after the new left became anti-Israel after 1967. And in a certain sense, took that radicalism and pushed it into, not pushed it, but brought it into a kind of more Jewish milieu. Some of them became the radical Jews of the far left, and some of them became the radical Jews of the far right. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that the person that made that comment, I think it's very important to note that in a certain sense, Kahana's popularity in America was for, in a very particular way, responding to the angst of a generation of children of survivors. Yeah. Immigrants and survivors, not, not everyone was a survivor, obviously. Was Kahana, I mean, he was saying never again with regard to the Holocaust specifically, and he was talking in his writing about, you know, a second Holocaust is inevitable or, you know, something is, is, is happening, is coming. Where was that idea originating with him? You know, he is not the children of survivors. He, right. Where's, it's, it's, where's that sense of, of, of um, connection with these first generation, second generation? Right. Very good, that, it's a very good question. His personal history is a really interesting one. He's living in a community where Holocaust survivors and their children are ubiquitous, right? Mm -hmm. Um, he's, you know, as my friend said, you know, who was younger than him, yeah, well, you, we, we went to yeshiva in Brooklyn, like, almost no one in my class had grandparents. That was the kind of, that was the kind of, you know, world it was. But Kahana's family had left before the Holocaust, either to the land of Israel or to America. But there is a story of an uncle of his father's, I'm not, an uncle of his, fa an uncle of his father's, who, um, was killed in the 1928 riot, Arab riot in Svat. Oh, and, yeah. that, and that story, that story weighed very, very heavily on the Kahana family. Um, Kahana's father, Charles Kahana, was a friend of Zeb Jabotinsky, and Zeb Jabotinsky used to stay in the Kahana house in Brooklyn when he was coming to America to raise money. Now, Jabotinsky died in 1940, Kahana was born in 1934, so Kahana might have remembered him just as a small child. Um, but Kahana's, you know, he was a member of Beitar, which was Jabotinsky's youth movement, the revisionist youth movement in Brooklyn in the 1950s. So there's a, there is a strong family story about death by violence. It's not the genocide of Europe. Um, and then there is the kind of the, the, the way in which his family um, absorbed that kind of, um, that kind of, uh, story. Now, I, I do want to raise one other point because there's a, an interesting cousin that he had whose name was Moshe Kahana, okay. who was an older, was older than Mayor Kahana, who was um, a rabbi in Houston, Texas, and actually a civil rights activist and marched with Martin Luther King and Selma in 1965. Wow. And, that, and that Mayor Kahana had a relationship with him. And when he, when he went to Texas to raise money, he used to stay in his cousin's house. Wow. Right? And this cousin Moshe grew up in Mandate Palestine and then only came to America when he was a kind of a young man. Interesting. Yeah. What an, what an interesting anecdote. I'm just, uh, you know, we're, we're reaching the end of our hour here. So um, what a very interesting anecdote to end yeah, on. I just want to say, you know, there is actually a book manuscript that I'm now reviewing for a press about Moshe Kahana and Mayor Kahana. 
the relationship oh, wow. between them. On their, uh, on their relationship? It's a fascinating book. That's very interesting. Um, I will reshare. Thank you again to everyone who joined us this afternoon with My Jewish Learning. I'm going to reshare the link to um, Shul's book and then another conversation we have for JTA, which is in print, if you prefer to read a, a written combo. I think a recording of this will also be live after after we go. Thank so, you. To book thank you all. The interview. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Shul. It was great chatting with you. If, if someone wants to get in touch with me, you could just, you know, DM me on Facebook or find me on Dartmouth Jewish Studies website. Great. Oh, thank you all for joining us. It was great. Great seeing you or seeing great your Zoom squares here. Great. Appreciate you. you coming. Bye all. Bye all.